Um, well, we got a lot of fun stuff specifically. I love that uh, Nancy actually last night, God bless her, thought that Joanne didn't specifically find the Portland story for her and just thought we oh. randomly had it. Uh, <laughs> no, it was very cute. Uh, see how we custom every show did. for our lovelies. Did. Yeah, so Walmart is going to close the remaining Portland stores as crime as their crime-ridden city battles a shoplifting wave. Theft is an issue. It's higher than what it has historically been, said CEO Doug McMillan during an appearance on CNBC's Squawk Box in December. December, so it's still an issue. Um, I think local law enforcement being staffed and being a good partner is part of that equation. If that's not corrected over time, prices will be higher and or stores will close. Um, Jordan Zaitz, a member of Portland Police's neighborhood response team, says we're having big retailers leave. I mean, to have Walmart close two of its stores is a really big deal. The people in those neighborhoods, that's where they shop. Nearly 600 employees who worked at the two stores face potential layoffs or transfers. Other major retailers with stores based in Portland have experienced issues with shoplifting. Last month, Nike asked officials for permission to post off-duty police officers officers at Portland-based stores with the authority to arrest shoplifters. Um, Jeremy Girard of the Oregon Retail Crime Association told the outlet that shoplifting has reached a crisis level in Portland. He estimated that the worst affected stores were losing as much as $5 million per year to theft. I like that that's Oregon Oregon Retail Crime Association. That's a that's an interesting uh, association to have. So Orca, Orca, there we go. Ooh. So um, Kennedy, our our good friend Kennedy, uh, actually had an, uh, a bit about this yesterday about crime and and obviously it's something that I'm continuing to cover. I'm back on the Portland beat almost full time at this point. I will say. Walmart has closed a lot of stores in the country in the past year. So you can't just say, I mean, I know people's like eyes on Portland now. Why is Portland just this city that is is really, really kind of like walking the death plank because mm. of their own policies? That is true. But it, yeah. they're not the only one. But it is the case. I just uh, did a story with two photographers on the ground there, and one was talking about the um, the Walmart in Delta Park. So one was sort of in North Portland and one was in Southwest and they're Southeast and they're both closing and it is true. But the one in Delta Park was, and the area's always a little bit scrungy. There've been a lot of like homeless stuff over there recently, but she was there, I guess about six months ago and they haven't allowed people, well, there have been no shopping carts at Walmart. Oh. for months and months because they've all been taken. So there are just no shopping carts and there are signs saying if you want to shop at Walmart, you got to bring your own. What do you do with a shopping cart? Well, I mean, what? good on you for stealing it, but well, then what? But, but what then do you, do you got a shopping cart. And what do you do at Walmart without a shopping People cart? People cannot yeah. shop. Yeah, that's true too. So she said she came, she said she rarely goes there, but she went there to get some things and she walks outside and she saw some people kind of like walking around the parking lot kind of looking and she realized they were from out of state and they said to her, What's going on here? <laughs> and she said, welcome to Portland. Yeah. So the stores have not closed yet. They're slated to close uh, at the end of March. Nike, which started in Oregon, right? right. Phil Knight and University of Oregon. And they have their um, he world headquarters in Beaverton, about 10 miles outside of Portland. They have a store, the Nike Outlet Store, which is right near my old house in Portland. And they have had so many break-ins that they've just, and, and they've had so much theft and break-ins that they've just been closed. And they finally said, okay, let's try to come up with a solution. And the solution was they wrote a letter to the mayor and said, we will pay our own dime off-duty police officers to patrol the store just so, because you can't make an arrest. If you're just like security, you mm -hmm. can't actually arrest them. Police officers can. Oh, but oops, Portland police, there's supposed to be a thousand basically per population. There's only 800 now. There's no, they can't do it. They don't have the bodies. Yeah. So basically the store just it's stays for all. The store stays closed. There's a fabulous Portland. Kennedy actually mentioned this in her um, in her in her in her show last night. There's a fantastic ice cream store called Salt and Straw. Like who waits online for ice cream? You wait online at Salt and Straw. It's so delicious. And they have had recently. There was a, a um, like an abandoned RV fire right by where they make their ice cream. They couldn't make the ice cream. Someone walked in and put a gun to an employee's head. She's like, I can't stay here. I can't stay here if my employees are at risk. That is what's happening in Portland right now, and it is directly, I'm sorry to tell you, and I'm not wrong about this, it is because of the policies that have been put in place over the past, 
I don't know, 10 years, but mostly the past three years. It's all these policies they're going to put in place to be better stewards and better humans and not charge people with crimes when they should be charged. The city is is going downhill. Uh, and, it, and it's just devolving into crime. And that's how it is. I'd always wanted to go to Portland until I met you. <laughs> and now I realize it's a pit of hell. It's 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 not great. It's not great. Right I've now. never been. Well, I already know the answer from your end. Uh, but what about you? You were used to be a young little New York punk. Did you ever yeah. used to uh, do a little uh, one-handed discount when you went to the shopping? <laughs> I the last time I stole uh, like from a store in New York, I was fourteen, and I stole some panties and lip gloss from Bloomingdale's. The only things I have stolen in the past twenty years are two bananas. Each time from an airport at like six in the morning from the Starbucks when there's like 30 people and you're just starving and there's a basket of bananas and I was like, oh, fuck it, I'm taking it. I've th bananas. Yes. And that's it. I don't, I don't steal. I did that with <laughs> chips when there was a long line. I was like, hey, no one's stopping me. And I felt bad about that. Believe it or not, I've never too. been much of a shoplifter. I haven't As a done kid, it. I stole a commando doll one time and I couldn't sleep for a week. Um, what about you, Welsh? Like, I, I found so it. So long ago that it was a chocolate bar. Oh, I remember those. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had like a red... The red, red packaging, red. and it had like little holes in them. Like, yes. sort of like it was... It was light chocolate. It was Swiss cheese it's, of it's chocolate only bars. only half a chocolate bar. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you steal the whole chocolate bar? <laughs> 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 the heavy chocolate bar. I would, I have nothing to back this up, and it's probably horribly sexist, but I believe that if you were to isolate the demo of people that could afford to buy something but don't and just steal it for the sick thrill, it would be more women than men. Teenage girls. Yeah, I oh, think so. Yeah. It's called the Winona Ryder effect. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's been enacted for a while. You, I'm sure you had a bunch of friends that stole. I know you never did. No, I once, I actually once stole from a Walmart, but by accident. Wow. Sorry. Yeah. I, I was shopping at Walmart and there was a pair of just like I was going to an ugly Christmas sweater party or something and there were like so Christmas earrings and I put them in the top rack of the shopping cart and I put my purse on top without realizing it so after I paid for all the stuff in the cart when I went out to my car picked up my bag I was like oh the earrings I'm not going back inside. And now we know why Walmart is closing. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm the problem, you guys. Oh, and you also stole the cute teddy bear from your friend and had zero remorse and oh, only felt true. bad that you got caught. Oh, that's true. That was budding sociopath. That was before Voice of the Martyrs. I just realized now that you talked about that that I did actually engage in post-chocolate chocolate bar stealing, Ooh. but it wasn't from retail. It was from frat parties at UC <gasps> Santa Barbara. Oh, that's great. So, like, you that's go Robin to a, Hood. You, Exactly, it was Robin Hood. <laughs> yeah. I would go to the bathroom, if you could ever get into the bathroom, because there's always the shenanigans happening, and I would open up the bathroom window, and I would, like, chuck out shaving cream and just whatever kind of things. And I might pick it up, I might not, usually I would not. Yeah. Um, but it was more just like, fuck those guys. Yeah. I love that. No, that absolutely, you get a mulligan on that one. Yeah, yeah we would steal stuff from construction sites. Like hammers and stuff, and that's then not nice. Hammers? That was bad. Hammers, hammers, hammers. Yeah, <laughs> bag of hammers. Yeah, I guess that's bad. Um, but again, when you're at a certain age, uh, it's usually um, a slap on the wrist. It's a testing thing. Young teenagers, yeah. not even like older teenagers. I think I think young teenagers do this. I don't. I'm not sure what it's about. In um, yeah. in New York, we're seeing more now them just locking up oh. everything in these yes. drug stores. You want Dove body soap? Good no, no, luck. No. You got to find an employee to open up the glass case for you. Every day, more and more stuff yeah. in CVS and uh, Dwayne Reed are locked under a plastic. Yep. Watch. Uh, this will be an important signifier. Look uh, next time you're in one of those at the toothpaste and see what is behind bars and what is open. Right. I, I did this uh, about a year ago at one uh, not far from where I live. And it was it was the the Tom's you know hippie crap. You can get that. Steal away, kids. Yeah. Crest. Nope. <laughs> Why is that? I actually would nobody have wants the hippie nobody crap. Wants it. Nobody I wants it. Nobody wants it. I assume the Tom's was like the the, the high end stuff. It, it is, expensive. but nobody wants it. Wants That's it. hilarious. It's garbage. It's like chalk. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had it. They, yeah. It's really yeah. bad. Um. Yeah. And it's just like everyone because New Yorkers are so impatient and need everything right away. It's the crap that's not being. Uh, it behind the plastic that's getting bought, not stolen, but just bought because it's, it's people can grab that and not have to wait for someone with a key. Also, some of it is weird. Like, I once had to get an employee, I wanted a pair of fake eyelashes. Aww. And I'm like, I'm going to wait here for someone to come and get me eyelashes. Do I need these eyelashes? Like, it really makes you second guess your purchase. Actually, that's true, too. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> 
particularly if you're a little drunk, you get that moment of clarity, and then you don't end up buying it. So thank you, plastic containers, <laughs> I guess. Um, and then on the Welsh side of things, not only did you have, actually, I would love his info um, at one point. I poach all of your guests. Okay. Uh, you guys just recently had Chris Steyerwalt Steyer on, and you wrote a great piece in Reason about the former Fox News political editor, politics editor, <clears throat> has been making the rounds for his new book, Broken News, Why the Media Rage Machine Divides America and How to Fight Back. Uh, the, pop, the Fox Public Relations Department was not shy about batting down the number crunchers' claims of being fired for his early election night call of Joe Biden winning Arizona. It's amazing how much they flipped out about an accurate call, and therefore likely the presidency. A uh, $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit filed by Dominion Voting Systems, which has been making the rounds as far as the text they've been revealing, which uh, for weeks after the election was accused by network personalities and guests of engineering a fantastical conspiracy to depose Donald Trump from the White House. I'm essentially plagiarizing Welsh right now. Sweet. Anchors and executives seeking to mollify the audience's angry Trump, Trump supporters by scapegoating employees, including uh, Starwalt's boss, Bill Sammons, I remember him, for indelicately delivering news the president didn't want to hear. Rupert Murdoch has been essentially saying he fears Trump. Uh, that's just going to make, make him feel great, better about himself. Uh, and, uh, yes, Tucker Carlson, all of these texts saying what um, they were saying the opposite of on screen. As of last night, Tucker Carlson went on air and said, while this lawsuit is ongoing, uh, that the election... The Trump-Biden election was a gross miscarriage of democracy, whatever that means. Uh, so he's doubling down despite all of this. Yeah, at first, I mean, if you recall, he did an interview with, I think, Sidney Powell, uh, one, of the, one of the crank lawyers that Trump had at the time. And uh, either it was an interview with her or, or a referencing or uh, that his producers had gotten in touch with her saying, hey, look, we need evidence for anything that you said. This is like in November 10th. This is right after the election, uh, Tucker. So on air, he was responsible at that time and said, look, they haven't produced any evidence for these claims that they're making. Remember the uh, what was the name of the place that her and Rudy Giuliani went to? The, the oh, the Four Seasons. The Four Seasons. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Four Seasons landscaping. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the Great Four Seasons press conference, which was a a, a large part of what we've uh, discovered in the Dominion lawsuit. So Dominion is a voting systems company. Yes. That was scapegoated by Lou Dobbs, uh, uh, Maria Bartiromo, Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and stuff as like somehow uh, they had uh, they were connected with the overseas ne'er do wells to try to like. Uh, uh, hack the election in favor of Joe Biden. It was crazy nonsense. It doesn't make sense. None of it was based on truth. And um, at that time, uh, you would have uh, people like a uh, Fox News reporter would go on 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 uh, uh, on air and say this. Uh, their claims are not uh, true from what we know. Uh, this, you know, the, there's a uh, integrity unit within the federal government. And they've released this statement about it. That's just uh, uh, the opposite. And at that time, you had. Uh, text messages between Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, and, and Tucker Carlson yes. saying she needs to be fired, um, uh, which is an amazing thing, including from Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson um, suggesting that a woman, and, and to Fox's credit, they did not fire her, but they right. did fire Bill Salmon. Yes. And they did, uh, or they allowed him to retire um, yeah. on the same day that they uh, that Rupert Murdoch suggested in an email or a text that let's get rid of Bill. So it kind of maybe would be related yes. Unfucking believable. Um, and said it, it that uh, uh, let's get rid of Bill. It'll it'll send a strong message to the Trump people. They were uh, really worried that this early call of Arizona, and it was the first call out there for Arizona. And there is actually a, a legitimate critique that they called it too early, based on what was known. It was correct, but it was may have been too early. I asked Chris Tyrell about that and uh, listened to the Fifth Column podcast for his answer. And uh, it's great. Um, it's a great, great episode. Yes, uh, great episode. I uh, appreciate that, but it's 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 fascinating to see people kind of try to react in real time. What you have is a lot of people who worked in the news division of Fox who felt like they were at least somewhat protected. And you guys know about that building. Um, there's always a news division and even people in the opinion division who work as very intellectually honest and rigorous journalists. That's some great people there. Um, and still do have some great people there, including Neil Cavuto, who Sean Hannity uh, thinks that he's in a position to criticize Neil Cavuto's journalistic work, which is amazing. Yeah, that's um, unbelievable. It is Ed unbelievable. Cavuto, uh, Cavuto who uh, took off Kaylee McEnany. I don't know if you heard, she used to be a spokeswoman. Yeah, do you Kaylee, know her? Do you know yeah, her? He cut his mic. Uh, um... <laughs> 
So he, he he cut her mic actually when she was saying nonsense and saying I can't in good conscience do this. And Sean Hannity uh, uh, flipped uh, flipped his wig uh, about that. Uh, so you what uh, the prevailing sentiment is in the building, especially among people who've been bounced, is that when Roger Ailes left in 2016 was pushed out for sexual harassment lawsuits, you lost the person within the building who said, we're going to protect the news division um, and we're going to keep them as sort of like made guys um, so that these two sides can coexist. It sounds like, and this is of course an incomplete lawsuit and discovery that's cherry picked and the Fox public relations people are right to point that out. It is cherry picked. Um, uh, at that same time, it sounds like, and looking at the conduct of the uh, of the network, that they kind of let those considerations of not of being worried about uh, alienated the Trump loving voters and audience, and worried that they're going to go to the next new place, um, uh, influenced their editorial decisions and personnel decisions in a way that's pretty unseemly, frankly. I love that his line that you requote in uh, the story that he said on the podcast along the lines of how they would look at hard news as, as vegetables and he's sort of like, at this point, why do we bother having all these vegetables at all as far as the way the Fox News looks at, it, like, looks at it? People don't like them, so why don't we just give the people what they want? And that's kind of where they're at now. One irony, I will say, as uh, uh, someone who I've known Tucker Carlson, I'm sure you guys do to. Um, Tucker Carlson was one of the better magazine journalists I don't in the country. I used to be kind of friends with Tucker. I don't know who this guy is. He, uh, he is not the same guy I knew. He is... He's a very talented broadcaster to this yeah. day. Um, I think he's going to interesting places legitimately, like, uh, uh, in his own mind, uh, ideologically right now, kind of in the post-Trump reconsidering things. I think that's all honest, where he's coming from. But his sense of journalistic exactitude, I think, has gone out the window in that oh, process. Um, and, and it's such an irony. Remember when he started The Daily Caller? This about 10, 15 years yes. ago. Mm -hmm. he's, he said, he gave a speech, and he was booed at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, when he was starting the Daily Caller. He said, everyone in this room, you know, we need to have our own New York Times. And what he meant at the time is we need to have our own conservative uh, journalistic institutions that nonetheless have that same sense of their own exactitude. Now, this is 15, 10, 15 years ago. New York Times has kind of sli times. slipped since yeah. then, um, to be sure. But like he was saying, look, don't boo me. Um, we need that on our, our side or else we're going to get sloppy and lazy and get things wrong. And we're just going to repeat the same errors that we're seeing uh, on the left uh, in their media institutions if we do this. I think that he has gone in that direction um, in what he has done. And now he's got the January 6th uh, tapes, which he's selectively uh, uh, leaking out there. I haven't watched it, so maybe it's fantastic. But uh, I tend to think it probably isn't based on what I've watched him talk about uh, the election now. So to your original question, is he doubling down? Kind of. He, I think he's come up with his own narrative that's different than the Sidney Powell narrative. It's not about hacked Dominion voting systems, but it's about irregularities in the in the uh, process of the election, the, the preponderance of mail-in ballots, which was new. It was a COVID thing, and it's kind of strange. And so how that process worked, and he's uh, using that to say that this is an, a highly irregular election, which I don't think is uh, something that's really backed up by the facts. He's a big smaller part of the bigger problem in Fox News, which is what Bill Salmon said way back in the day when this was all initially going on, which was big ratings makes for bad journalism. Oh, and let me tell you, the, the main thing I remember from every show I did and every meeting we would have before every show was the last show's numbers. Quarterly numbers, yes. too. Like each quarter of the show, like each block. Oh, yeah. Which did. And what segment were we doing where we got the most views? So it's it's just like posting something on social media, a selfie, and it gets way more likes. So you're like, well, I guess I should post more of that. Yeah. It's really just letting the viewer dictate what you're putting out for the viewer. So it's really, it's not even... It's to the point where it's not even about journalism anymore. It's just placating the viewer. There's a demand side issue, and we talk about this with Steyerwald, and it's something I've written and talked about, and I'm sure uh, Nancy has as well. Um, there's a demand side issue in all of journalism, ideological, non-ideological, audience capture at the New York Times, very much, even by the people who work at the New York Times yeah. believe in the audience capture. So we should think about that. It's very easy to say, oh, Rupert Murdoch's evil, Fox is evil, Tucker Carlson's evil. I don't think actually any of those people are evil. Um, or 
that and that Fox is evil, but there is they are catering to that demand, and uh, that's a demand problem too. Um, that that is people if their media diet is bad, and if they're demanding of their own uh, outlets that they come to their own conclusion. If Nancy's audience says, "I need her to always think this about Portland," then Nancy would be corrupted. Fortunately, we know that she's incorruptible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe me, I've been very unpopular with what, what I've written about Portland, and and also my views change. On I'm Portland. just unpopular. And I, and I, I, Fine. <laughs> so, um, but it, it it's it's so much more interesting to actually let the story keep going where it's going. Mm. I, I have a question for all you guys. What do you think? And I know historically, it's like I know, but these things don't really work. What do you histor- What do you think the chances of Dominion winning this law- lawsuit? Uh, small. Small. Jacob Sullivan, my colleague at Reason, who's way smarter than I am, uh, thinks that it's a decent chance because Lou Dobbs in particular uh, acts so venally and, and there's things. But it, the defamation is rightly very difficult to prove in this yeah. country. Mm-hmm. The irony is that you have people like Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis right now trying to open up the libel laws, as they said, or make it easier for people right. to, de- uh, to degrade the standards set by New York Times versus Sullivan, the 1964 Supreme Court case. Um, if they succeeded in that, Dominion would win. Um, but they haven't yet so far. So I think Dominion will lose. But the question for me that's more interesting is what we learn about the Fox internal culture as part of that process and then how they're going to respond to that, if at all. Um, are they going, is Rupert Murdoch going to make Suzanne Scott take the fall, which right. you've seen some reporting right. on? Um, are they going to change their ways? Lou Dobbs is not, does, no longer works there. Um, so maybe they will change some way that they approach these things. And let's keep in mind, Trump is going after Murdoch now because these things yes. show that Murdoch thought yes. this whole thing was. BS to begin with. And he's like, oh, Rupert. And so now all Steve Bannon has declared a war against uh, Fox News. So that is an ongoing fight. And apparently they're doing a soft, very soft sort of uh, ban on Trump. I mean, they'll mention him when they have to. I guess he's a little more prevalent on FoxNews.com, but they're trying to hedge their bets on avoiding discussing in period. Kennedy had him on last night, I think. Oh, really? Sure. Or did he grovel? I didn't know. Because I didn't uh, what did they say I here? One of, the, one of the texts was about how Hannity was uh, quietly disgusted by uh, Trump as well. I'm quietly sure. disgusted. Super yes. quiet. Uh, <laughs> Real quiet. Yeah, it says perhaps the net, Sean Hannity, perhaps the network's most enthusiastic Trump booster, has been, quote, privately disgusted by Trump for weeks, but was scared to lose viewers. That's pretty succinct. In the wake of the January 6th insurrection, according to text between Murdoch and Paul Ryan. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, and Suzanne Scott... Boy, I knew her way back when. She always treated me with equal parts. It was very generous. Condescension Mm -hmm. and derision. Uh, Like the rest of us. Yes, true. That's true. (laughs) I liked her. I'd like to think that I I pissed her off by being there seven years longer than she thought I was going to be. So that, I felt it was my small Um, victory. I had been on, I was on Fox Business a ton Yeah, And it got to the point, got to the point where I was like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I remember one time I was on Charles Payne's show, and they were talking about the stock market, and I zoned the fuck out. (laughs) And then he goes to me, and he's like, Joanne, what do you think? And I was just like, well, you got to be aggressive. And he was like, exactly. (laughs) But I then went to Suzanne, and I was like, can I not? Can I not do these shows anymore? And she's like, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why people keep putting you on them. You're great, but, like... It's fine if, if you stop. And I'm like, okay, great. Maybe that's why she didn't like me. I'd be like, no, keep bringing it. I got these thoughts on mutual funds. Think, you yeah. got to hear them. You got to. By the way, now is as good a time as any to promote both of Joanne's books. Uh, let the well, market yes. decide. You know what? I should thank Fox Business and for cons- sparking this interest. And capitalism, question mark? Yes. Uh, they're available <laughs> anywhere f- wide-scale fraud. Keep in mind, the S in is- capitalism is a dollar sign. Uh, and, uh, and also, yeah. that is just a sticker where it says New York Times bestseller. That's not a fact. It's just a sticker put well, on a graphic of well, a book that doesn't exist. Hey, free speech, man. It's always a sticker. You put the sticker on the book because after the book was made, then it, it became a bestseller. I just didn't want people to be confused that it was an actual thing. As, no, you know. no, it's a it's a thing. There's, no, no, there's neither a picture of it. It's real. Legally. And there's a sticker. Yeah. Okay. So and this is on And don't forget challenge. about the major yeah. motion yeah. picture. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Major yeah. motion picture. <laughs> Yep. Look at Bradley Cooper's playing me wow. and Joe's favorite actress. Although Joe was upset for not being cast as herself. I don't know why they didn't cast me as me. Yeah. Um, uh, Jennifer Lawrence is a national treasure, so yeah. that's why. Yeah. Um, so that will be good as well. I like it. That is an actual outfit I wore, but that is Bradley mm-hmm. <laughs> Bradley, yes. Bradley Cooper's head right there. Boy, that's going to be good. Yeah. 
it's, it's dropping soon, I guess, before the book. Yeah, I'm still waiting for my check for the movie rights. But. Um, there is, uh, let's see, who was this? Uh, Washington Post. So, I don't know, believe it or not. Uh, this is a study on sex and exercise. Is it? Question mark. See, I learned that from your capitalism book. Thank you. Um, the studies, uh, this, uh, in a new study, researchers found involved mainly committed heterosexual couples, usually married, who often visited a lab for scientific observation for their excursions. Who are these people? Yeah. On occasion, the coitus took place at the volunteers' homes. Some of the couples wore heart rate monitors and others had trackers. Sexy. They found, seriously, that heart rates averaged between 90 and 130 beats per minute and peaked at anywhere from 145. That means nothing to me. Women's heart rates tended to be lower than men's. Of course, guys, ladies, half the time you just lie there. Uh, in one study, total energy expenditure during a single session of sexual activity reached 130 calories. See, that's what I was interested in. Well, in another experiment, it topped out at about 101 calories for men and 69 calories for women. Women, I know how they did that. And on some would just get the award already for clip art on this yeah. one. Yeah. That's just that's fantastic. such a hot. I need to see one. Uh, that's you actually, guys on that one. That's too? actually my favorite sexual position, right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know that they're not having sex in that position. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, that's a good way to not have kids. Yeah. CrossFit couples are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> in the unhealthy couples, in one study, sex lasted for about 32.38 minutes. Who are these marathon runners? While it continued to only be about 19 minutes in other studies. Uh, in all the sorry, other if studies. If I know I'm being documented I'm for a study, I'm going to put a little more effort That's in. That's true. Yeah. That's why you can't less. take any sure. of these. <laughs> you can't take any of this that seriously. Dur duration was considered to start with foreplay and end with the male orgasm. Now we're talking. <laughs> Only thing that that's it. That's all you need. After that, so I'll, I'll bets are off. Uh, 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 of 6,847 sudden cardiac. Oh, and then they get into the heart attack thing. Nobody has heart attacks while they're having sex. Oh, really? Not true. Well, if they have very few unless, unless they had heart it? issues to begin with. Yeah. Which goes without saying. The last thing they dealt with, which I'd actually interviewed a female boxer about one point. At one point, she argued it: women weaken the legs, rock. Uh, they talked about exercise after sex. The long-running th myth, obviously, with boxing is that you don't have sex oh, yeah. while you're training. Sex on game day. Oh, I, I, um, and they said that that is ap uh, if as long as it's. Uh, as a, they said that sexual activity within 30 minutes to 24 hours before exercise does not appear to affect aerobic fitness, musculoskeletal endurance. Or or strength and power. No, it's all in your brain, man. Mm -hmm. That's why no sex on game day. You gotta ha keep your edge. I think that's more of it than the actual exertion. You know, yeah, I think it's, it's the whole like becoming an angry, you yeah. know, rep repressed. And I think there's a lot to that. But as for the rest of it, I mean, did we really? Did we think sex was exercise? Well, of course, you're gonna burn some calories. You're doing more than just sitting on the couch watching TV. I mean, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Don't you sometimes like? Get up the next day and you're like, oh man, my I like your leg muscle, especially like your inner thighs or your stomach muscles will hurt. Never. Oh, tell that me more. I believe. <laughs> I believe that about you. I don't know. <laughs> well, I would always look at. I always used to say use. I would always think of your line with regards to sex as I do with running, because I have, oh, don't yes. really have the sex. But uh, with running, I'm like, I never really want to do it, but I'm always happy I did after I yes. did it. And Joanne would look at sex that way. No, it's, no, no, but I've always said for couples, like married couples who like aren't having sex anymore or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, just treat it like a workout. It's something you should do. It's good for you. You never regret doing it afterwards. So just just put a little effort in and do Glenn, it. Glenn Reynolds the, of Instapundent fame as a law professor oh, yeah. and uh, those uh, early blogging world days uh, described this as maintenance sex hmm, and recommended sure. that uh, married couples uh, just you know have your maintenance sex. I think Dr. Yeah. Ruth said that too to couples that were kind of like post-sexual. She's like just something like just grab the penis. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. That was, was one like, of her first books. Can we get title. that on the loop, please? Yes. <laughs> Meme machine. Can you do it one more, but this time pet the loris uh, as if oh. you were a James Bond villain? <laughs> you don't have to.
<laughs> no, I don't. I know. <laughs> don't, I don't want to force memes down down on you throat there, but uh, like yeah. It's, well, and it's it's fuck it's it's hilarious too. That remember, like a couple years back, this couple that decided to have sex every day for a year became like a global celebrities because they decided to do this, and they like made the rounds and all the Today yeah. Show and stuff like that. They even one of those like boxes uh, suspended above the city or anything like that. No, it wasn't like it, it, that's just, that's the thing. It was so they weren't doing it in any type of interesting or creative way, but the very idea that people would have sex every day was every so insane. Day. Dude, we grew up when, like, I like every was... day there'd be someone running naked somewhere. Like, mm. and now we're impressed by people who are just having sex yeah. every day. I That's don't it. know. I gotta say, I don't think, like, when I was younger, like, with my daughter's dad, we had sex every day. Really? Yeah. God bless. That... I mean... Sometimes twice a day. I mean, like. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Disgust reflex just. Uh, no, in. it's I. Uh, who has the time? <laughs> Actually, when I think about it, you have a lot of time. Oh, but Vanderpump Pump Rolls isn't going to watch itself. That's true. <laughs> Particularly yeah, the marathons. That's true. There wasn't there. That's right. It was pre. It was pre-internet. That is interesting. It was pre-internet. Yes. Yes. Pre-internet. You needed more entertainment. So, yeah. And you know what? Pre-cell phone. And no. speaking of free time, what did we not see? Remember the baby boom we were all expecting after the pandemic? There was a, that didn't happen. Oh, untrue. There's a, a there's a micro boom. There was a there was a, oh, there was a, a bit. You would have thought pandemic. though, on paper, it would have been a huge one. No one's at work. Everyone's stuck with each other. But what did happen, and I knew it was going to happen, upswing and divorces. Of course, huge. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No one's supposed to be together all day. Well, there every were, day. I interviewed um an attorney at that point and she was talking about how she was a divorce attorney and there were people that were about to enter their divorce and then they couldn't the courts closed oh. and these people are now in their houses together <laughs> for and she's I and this was in the midst like I don't know what happened she's like yeah. some of them it was just torture she was sure and others maybe, oh my maybe decided to stay together Oh boy, they have bad domestic violence numbers in that too. Oh, actually, apparently, I mean, I'm I don't really know the data, the solidity of that, but they people did talk about that too. It wasn't a wasn't a great time. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll go a little bit over just because we like it when you guys are here. What uh, guest choice? Uh, I know there are a couple that you guys liked. Huh? And of course, they're not in front of me story wise. Oh, of uh, of story topic, here. I know you're, you're... Oh, Chris Rock, you want to do that? Sure, yeah, do that. This is a down date. Oh, we don't need a down date. Um, <laughs> apparently, says Newser.com, Chris Rock has, quote, has a problem with black women. Most take note of how Rock not only went after Will Smith in his live stream Netflix special, but his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. Candace McDuffie at The Root um, says, or there was a headline, Chris Rock still deserved to be slapped by Will Smith, writes that by repeatedly going after Jada, Rock was true to form. All we have to say is we told y'all Chris has a problem with black women. The piece runs through past examples over the years. Um, at USA Today, Kelly Lawler wasn't impressed either, saying if he is going to joke about Jada Pinkett Smith and extensively address the Oscar slap, the punchline has to be better than calling her a gendered slur over and over again. In fact, the 58-year-old we Rock came anymore. off as predictable and boring and downright old throughout the entire set. She I don't writes, know about that. It was embarrassing to watch Rock complain about the kids with their wokeness and their social media and their feelings. I thought he called her a predator, and he called Will Smith a bitch. Yeah, so Will Smith was the bitch. Will Smith was yeah, the that's bitch, right. And he called her a predator. Yes. Mm, Which is so kind of, of true. Out, yeah. yeah. Um, Anyone who's watched the video he talked about. Which I watched it. We put it in the show notes. So we, we interviewed um, Stephen Elliott, who just won his or settled his case against Maura Donegan, the shitty media men list. Well, oh, I haven't listened. I haven't listened to that one. Oh, wait, it, no, it, I did. That was a while no, ago. No, it's no. dropped. No, that I, we had him on the show in right, October, okay. but it, it drops tomorrow <clears throat> on National Women's Day because Sarah wanted to drop something on National Women's Day so she could hear about how much I didn't care about National happy Women's National Day. Happy National Women's Day, um, Eve. Yeah, by you by haven't way. even but, um, wished me a happy month. Thanks a lot. Uh, I was waiting for tomorrow to get you your present. Um, but anyway, we we put the, that clip in the show notes, and it is very clear that she was just pissed off and gave him the look that was like, you can do something about this, and he did something about it. And the worst video is the one that Chris Rock was alluding to, which oh, was God. when she interviews him <laughs> yes, on camera mm-hmm. about what it was like for him when she cheated on him. Yes. Mm-hmm. He's like, we've all that? been cheated on. We've not been interviewed by the person who's cheated. <laughs> On, on, a, on the red table, whatever it's that called. That is, I mean, I, uh, I hope Will Smith doesn't slap me, but... 
Well, That's one, a bitch. I listened to your Him. guys' most recent one, too, and one thing Moynihan said that I disagreed with, he's like, the whole uh, Will Smith thing was more just a, a rant than a comedy. I thought it was absolutely hilarious, particularly the last part where he's like, I used to love Will Smith, and, you know, I was rooting for him my whole career, but now I watched Emancipation, and I was rooting for the master. And he's like, <laughs> and he kept saying, like, he's like, he kept saying, you missed a spot, master. Whip him there. <laughs> I haven't seen that. Bit. It was, <laughs> oh man, it oh, was man. so good. But I think really what it is with Chris Rock's content, he'll treat everyone equally, right? I mean, he had a, yeah. a so documentary. It matter if you're a woman or a man, if, right. if I can make a joke out of you, I will. Yeah, he's a comedian. That, that's what he does. Yeah. He had a documentary called Black Hair. He, anyone, uh, oh, sure. And then 15 years ago thousands of so. money they spent straightening it. And and it was all like it was because he has, I think, two daughters, at least one. And uh, and he wanted them to grow up feeling fine about who they are and like sort of got into the psychology of it. It doesn't strike me as the work of like a misogynist racist to make mm -hmm. a documentary uh, trying to kind of uplift the lived in experience of black women. I don't know. Yeah.